Hello and welcome back and before we start today's video a very quick disclaimer originally my review of this the silicon power xs70 was meant to go out about a month ago I did a full review of this did the testing did the ps5 testing however when I filmed this intro that you're seeing here originally it turned out my camera decided to go on an absolute mental. All the settings went mad, and I'm sure it's here on screen. The lighting and the bloom were crazy, and I got to the point where I was editing, and unfortunately, it was just not usable. So, what I'm doing is refilming the entire introduction and beginning of this video, but all the testing and the PS5 testing later in the video does remain. I just wanted to apologize for how long it's taken me, taken me to do this review for this, the Silicon Power XS70. Again, one of the best SSDs I've seen here on the channel for a very long time. But for now, let's crack on with the review and talk a little bit about this new SSD. So here we are. This is the SSD. Now, let's be honest. I did some bold claims there in the intro, didn't I? Saying this is one of the best SSDs I've featured on the channel. I have featured some killers. The Seagate Fire CUDA 530. The some of the Sabrent stuff that we talked about there. We talked about WD's latest entry, the 550X. We talked about Samsung's Pro. There have been a lot of good SSDs on this channel for PC utilization and of course PC and PS5 gamers. What on earth makes this SSD have the gall to think it can be better than those? There's a few reasons as we'll go through the video. But again, much like my disclaimer at the beginning, as you can see, I've already opened this. I've opened it in my original recording. So when you get it, it won't have a tear in the front because you won't have to re-record your intro. But I'm going to stop going on about that. Just throwing it out there. So, um... The Silicon XS, it arrives in 1TB, 2TB, and 4TB, 129, 249, and $749 respectively. Now, this is already pipping lower in price than a lot of SSDs with the same caliber hardware inside. And then you dig a little further and find out it's actually on promo in a bunch of websites for another 10 to 20 to 40 dollars cheaper depending on the capacity. So already the price point is very, very appealing for some people out there. Now, carrying on from that, we can talk a little bit about that architecture. This, of course, arrives with the Fizon E18 controller. Most PCIe Gen 5 SSDs right now do. Again, it's had lots of firmware updates and they all have firmware updates on their SSDs, but this drive also arrives with updated NAND inside. If we open it up, and again, the packaging is very underwhelming. It is just card and plastic. So again, that is something I'm not a huge fan of, but let's face it, you're only gonna look at the packaging once. Unless you're me making this video, I'll stop going on. So straight away, when we look at the external case in there, we can see that SSD. Let's get the thumbnail sorted. Now, that heatsink there at the top is incredibly low level uh, there. We've already looked at silicon power SSDs here on the channel, but it's very nicely designed. It isn't, it is uh, made up of three pieces there of the base level plate there, as you can see, and then you've got that ventilated top aluminium panel there, and then you've got a further channeling panel there on the top, and again. Throughout this video, I am going to keep referring to that price tag because it's important because that NAND that I was going to talk about, this SSD arrives with 3D TLC NAND from Micron. Again, fires on the 18, again, 3D TLC NAND. Most SSDs right now have that. But this is 176 layer 3D TLC NAND. Now, on top of that, because they're not the only SSD recently to have upgraded their NAND from 96 layer to 176 layer, this also arrives with 700, 1400, or 3000 terabytes written rating for endurance. That equates to a 0 0.7 drive rights per day, DWPD. Ultimately, how much data can be written to it per day? And that means on the one terabyte that you can write 700 terabytes per, I'm sorry, 700 gigabytes per one terabyte per day to this drive. Now, why is that something to sing and dance about? That's because this SSD with its fires on the AT controller and its Micron 176 layer NAND and its drive rights per day of 0 0.7 means it is the same specifications 
as the Fire Cuda. The Fire Cuda, which is substantially more expensive than this SSD. It doesn't have the Rescue Recovery Service, but it does arrive with the five years of warranty. It does arrive with the heatsink included, because remember, the Seagate Fire Cuda heatsink model using that EK Gamer heatsink is way more expensive. And this one arriving, again, 129, 249, and 749 respectively, again, with price differences floating around out there in the market. It's got the other kind of components we're used to when we talk about these SSDs. It's got DDR4 memory there, one gig and two gig to each of the capacities there. And the performance threshold, again, challenges that of that big gunner in the market, the Fire Cuda, with a, a sequential read performance at 7,300 and sequential write performance, depending on the capacity, ranging between 6,000 and 6,800. This is the 1TB model. So again, this performance is going to set that 6,000 mark. But again, because I've already done the testing in the past, I can tell you right now that this performance is good for a 1TB. I'll definitely give it credence for that. We're not going to hit 6,800, but I will say, you know, for a 1TB, we hit some good numbers. Now, the IOPS uh, at the 1TB level is reported at 750,000. Uh, read up 4K random IOPS and 1 million 4K write IOPS. And again, that goes up to 1 million over 1 million as well as you go up to the capacities. Again, the same as the Fire Cuda. That's the big arching narrative of this SSD and why, again, you guys have asked for the review, but also why I wanted to review it because it's the same architecture as the biggest, most expensive enduring SSD in the market without the price tag to match. Now, again, we're going to make our way onto a PC benchmark in just a moment and some PS5 games testing with this just in a moment. But ultimately, right now, this is sort of, in terms of endurance and performance, it's kind of the SSD to beat for its price tag. I think the Fire Cuda still brings a little bit more to the party, but this draws the line very, very close by. And given its availability worldwide, and the fact that you are getting an SSD with a PS5 profile heatsink on board, I think a lot of people are going to be interested in this. But that's enough of this. Let's get on to the testing, get it in the PC for the benchmark testing, and after that, slam it in the PS5 and do some great games testing. Let's make our way over to the screens. Okay, so we've made our way over to the test machine here. We've plugged in the SSD, and as you can see there, it is taking advantage of PCIe 4x4 architecture there, NVMe Express 1.4. We've had some tests running on and off for a while here, and if we have a look at the temperatures, you're able to see there that it started off at um, a moderate base level of 40 degrees, which is a little hotter than I wanted, would have liked. I left it there for a while, and then, of course, as the system completed its boot sequence, we can see it went down to 24 at idle. And then throughout the course of these testings, we went all the way up to a peak of 45, which is actually pretty good for an SSD with onboard heatsink there. I'm really glad it didn't break into the 50C because although it would still run fine between 50 and 70, you don't really want to see temperatures like that generally. And even at the peak testing here, which was a 16 gig, um, crystal disc test there 45 degrees is still pretty good for us to be dealing with there so on the left hand side of the screen here we're able to see the specifications uh, from silicon power themselves there lots of information there with regard to the mtb after performance and once again these performance benchmarks that they're presenting there are kind of based on the 4TB model, and we're dealing with a one terabyte model here today. Um, I've mounted the drive as you normally would, and the first test I want to look at there are the results from the crystal disc testing there. So let's get rid of everything there in the background. And as you can see, we've got a one gigabyte test file there, a four gigabyte test file, a 16 gigabyte test file, and that was with sequential read, sequential write, and some mixed 7030 testing there, all the way through. We've even got details on the IOPS. Now, um, in order to give you some sense of relativity about this, I'm going to be comparing this SSD against the Team Group T-Force Cardia, uh, very similar architecture SSD there, and we're going to be comparing them side by side. So, as you can see, uh, what we'll look at first, on the bottom right of the screen here, is the Team Group SSD and the 1GB test. So, side by side, with the left one here, 
being the um, silicon power drive here, you can see that did indeed break into the 7000s there. It exceeded uh, sequential read and write versus the Team Group SSD there. Um, in terms of IOPS, it was pretty even between the two of them. And for the rest of the test, it was kind of level pegging between them. But it has to be said, in terms of sequential read-write, the Team Group Cardia here on the right-hand side of the screen um, was outpaced by that of the Silicon Power, which, again, I'm sure is great news for anyone considering this SSD. If we have a look at the 4GB test file left and right of the screen, we see this time the Team Group took the lead on at least that file type at 4 gig with 69 over 6000 versus 64 over 58 there on sequential read write and indeed in terms of IOPS it still outpaced it marginally on both read and write IOPS finally we can look at the largest file type there and again this time the left hand side of the screen the team group there breaking into 7000 under 58 and the uh, silicon power one just shy of it in those tests there and indeed it, although in IOPS it did go higher in both read and write IOPS in terms of sequential read write we can see that the um, silicon power SSD was the overall victor um, overall there so we can go through and see between all of those tests in terms of crystal disk it's still better than similar SSDs priced at the same level there on the market so now let's go over to Atto Crystal uh, Atto Disk Benchmark there again three tests side by side. We are running a 256 megabyte file, a one gigabyte file, and a four gigabyte file. Once again, we're going to return to the Team Group uh, SSD there, bring that up, and this time we're going to compare them side by side. We've got the one gig file there, put those side by side, and as you can see there on screen, on the left-hand side there, the Silicon Power. On the right-hand side, the Cardero. Now it's a little bit blurry there, so let's zoom in a little bit. We can see that it was pretty much level pegging between them. I mean, again, the peaks, the highs, the file types, it's pretty much the same thing. Indeed, if we switch to IOPS on this SSD and have a look how they compare. Oh, let's go back to... We can see, once again, very similar numbers, although arguably it has to be said in terms of read IOPS, we did see higher numbers there on the Team Group drive. Again, if we make our way to a 4 gigabyte file there, so you've got the 4 gigabyte Silicon Power here and the 4 gigabyte Team Group Cardia, we can see that in terms of read write, again, very similar numbers, very small differences between them of less than 100 megabytes in the majority of cases, but the Team Group was just still a little higher there. If we go to the IOPS on both of those, once again, same story, IOPS appearing to be higher on the Team Group than they were on the Silicon Power. Still very high numbers, and those differences being very, very small, but still, overall, definitely lower numbers. Although, I will highlight, once again, if we go into it there, if we look at the temperatures that we looked at earlier on, you're able to see that the Team Group SSD there, even though it had a heatsink on board, the heatsink wasn't as effective as it was on the silicon power one with the silicon power peaking at 45 there as you can see from the measurements the team group one getting as high as 52 or 53 degrees in the crystal disc testing so the heatsink definitely done its job in assisting that controller from getting too hot there if we make our way out of atto disc um, benchmark there we'll make our way into ASSSD, arguably a much more aggressive tool there in terms of ssd measurements once again going back into the team group there and how it measured things let's have a little look so let's go first look at traditional read writes there so again comparing them side by side the team group once again just a pinch ahead on all of those uh, stats there if we change that over to iops like that make its way around we can see the iops again just a pinch higher on the team group there and remember these ssds the Team Group is a little bit more expensive, so it's whether you're prepared to pay that little bit extra for that little increase in performance there uh, in some of these key areas. If we look at three um, uh, gigabyte test file there. Once again, this time the performance was notably higher there um, on both degrees there on the Team Group overall. And the same goes if we make our way into IOPS. You can see in terms of IOPS, a notable increase there and overall just a better score there at the bottom as well. And that was something that was continued throughout the remainder of the tests as well. 
if we looked at them. Although things, once again, is a kind of a running theme there when we've looked at the silicon versus the tin group, that the larger the file size, we start to see the silicon have a better job of getting that performance. So again, I think this is a question of how much better this SSD deals with larger files than small. And another reason why I feel why silicon power probably aren't as loud as they could be about those reported IOPS numbers there. So finally, we're going to make our way into um, AJA. Now, AJA takes advantage of a uh, slightly different measure of SSDs. It's far more based on um, uh, file format. So in this case, for example, we were looking at a 1080p 10-bit uh, file there. We're not looking at the big numbers. Ignore the big numbers. We're looking at the graphs there at the bottom with a 1 gigabyte test file, a 4 gigabyte test file, and a 16 gigabyte test file there. And again, we make our way into the Team Group SSD, compare them all side by side, bring that down. First up, we're going to look at a 1 gigabyte test file. And as we can see, between the two of them, it was a, be a better peak performance on the Team Group than it was on the Silicon Power SSD. Once again, we'll go to the four gigabyte test file now and we look at the pair of them and this time still higher on the tin group but once again not quite as high both ssds doing a consistent uh, cache there throughout and finally we can look at the 16 gig test file and once again we're seeing that in terms of disk reads very similar numbers in d's and closing the gap between them so the performance on this ssd is still good uh, you know, it is a more affordable SSD out there, but at least as far as uh, PC benchmarks are, I still rate this SSD right now. But for now, when a number of you that have come to this video that wanted to see how this performs on the PS5, I've probably looked at a lot of the stats so far and say, big whoop, lot of numbers, tell me what it does on the PS5. So let's make our way over to the PS5 system and see just how this SSD benchmarks and performs on that. Okay, so we're loading it up on the PS5. We've already installed uh, the 70 here from Silicon. So what we're going to be going for this now is we're going to be having a little look at a few different tests. The first thing we want to do is format this SSD. This is the PS5 to give us a reading on this drive. And again, we can perform a multiple tests, but 6500 is a very good early test for this SSD there. Um, and what we'll do is we'll very quickly do a secondary test as well because sometimes when we do the benchmark it's always good to have uh, just kind of more than one average there to work between and sometimes we found uh, for good or for bad that retesting an SSD can give us a little bit more information there so let's go ahead and reformat that SSD and when it's doing this reformatting this normally will result in a lower benchmark because the SSD uh, is working a little bit harder there. The controller is going to be a bit heavier. We're not emptying the cache in the conventional way because uh, of the way the PS5 is built. But redoing a test just gives us a good understanding of just how solid that number is. Sometimes when we've done this test, it can differ by as much as 500 megs and therefore I'm glad I did it. But it's going to be interesting to see just how uh, different this second format test error of the benchmark on this SSD is going to be. So let's go on and format this SSD once again. Remember the previous score was 6,500 plus. Let's have a little look. And 6,500 plus, a very, very good benchmark there for this SSD. Now, again, we've already done the PC testing. We've done the, the talk to camera bit where I've talked to you guys a lot about the uh, build of this SSD. So let's go straight ahead and go right into this SSD and start moving those games over. We're going to be looking at four games very, very quickly in today's video. So we're going to be moving over the games. Don't worry too much about that Elden Ring update there at the top. That's going to use the internal PS5 SSD. And we're not going to be measuring speed anyway. We're just going to move 255 gig of data. Let's go. And while it does this, just real quick, don't worry, you're not going to have to wait around. We're just going to take a little look here uh, of the speed being reported there. And again, we're seeing some lovely write speed there immediately of what's being burned across to that SSD. Now again, I'm not going to make you guys sit through this whole transfer here because there is an element of compression happening between the PS5 and the SSD that is a native read right here. There's definitely stuff happening in the middle and therefore it makes this benchmark largely inaccurate. But what I'm going to do is fast forward to our first game test, which is Far Cry 6. 
Right, so our data has transferred, so let's go straight into our first game, which is Far Cry 6. And again, Far Cry 6 is kind of a multi-platform game here, so we're starting soft. Uh, we have got some more intense games coming up, but for now, what we're going to do is just go into a nice straight loading segment directly to a checkpoint in the game. So let's go ahead there, then let's set up its profile, and we're just going to test the loading there against the internal SSD. 3, 2, 1 as we're loading in now. Hopefully that'll be nice and quick. So let that load in there and almost there. Boom, done. Lovely stuff. So let's go ahead and jump on our weird little bike over here just for the hell of it. And all we're gonna do, nice and simple, is just move along in the game. So again, an SSD like this that has a pretty impressive benchmark there uh, for it and of course the uh, hardware inside to back it up. What you're looking at in a game like this is how the game swaps out the textures. We want to know that as we get closer to objects, that as the game swaps those textures out, therefore drawing a lot more information from the SSD for the CPU, GPU, and memory to handle, that it's able to do it. So as I'm driving along, do look into the distance. You'll see assets popping into existence or being swapped out for denser objects as well. Typically, you notice this more in trees, but it is still something that happens all the way through. Most people assume that when you load a game, all of those assets are loaded in uh, front-ended, front -ended, and therefore all the data is on hand. That is simply not true, particularly with open-world games like this, where the game is procedurally loading all the time. It is bringing in data, and therefore you need a super-fast SSD to supply data as fast as possible to that CPU, GPU, and memory. But for now, that looks pretty good indeed. So if we quickly move back, get the game to load back to that checkpoint. Let's go in, see how that compares. We can see making sure that game loads in lovely and fast for this SSD for the PS5. And that felt pretty natural, pretty organic. Let's call our vehicle there. And for now, I'd say that's pretty good. Loading in the way I would like to see it. The game loading nice and fast for us there. Again, rather annoyingly, I'm stuck here behind this little wall. But for now, I'd say this is absolutely fine. Those textures there, even if we look around the car as we drive, all those textures seem just the way I'd like to see them. All the way around. And again, it's another one of those games that uses foggy mirrors because it can't be bothered to do the work on a mirror. Actually, that's disingenuous. It's not like this game is made by a terrible company or nothing. Um, but yes, for now, I'd say that's absolutely fine. The game loaded f nice and fast. Let's move on to our next test, the Demon Souls PS5 remake. So here we are, title screen of Demon Souls. Let's make our way in. We're going to make sure we stay offline in three, two, one. Loading in, lovely and fast. We're going to make our way in into the Nexus. Lovely stuff there. And again, the game's loading in gradually. You can see that darkness fading in. The game does do that to hide some of the silent loading there in the background. Uh, first thing we're going to do is go ahead and test uh, loading into an area of the game, Upper Latria. So we're going to go for that one there. It's a nice vertical level. It's going in three, two, one. Nice and fast. Again, I've got to say, after clocking up more than 120 hours on Elden Ring, that is the first game that's made me look at this and go, well, this is really nice, but what it needs is a jumping horse. Uh, for now, I'd say, though, the graphics still running pretty well for me there. Looking absolutely great. Again, we can look around all the textures, all the lighting. We're playing this at 60 frames as well. So for now, that's still looking pretty darn good to me there. Carry on moving along. But for now, I'm quite pleased with that. That thing just committed suicide, which is fairly grim on its own. Um, but yeah, I'd say right now I'm quite pleased with the progress there. The lighting still looks fantastic, distance, everything still looks absolutely A1 to me. I'm happy with it. Let's head back to the Nexus, and then from there, what we'll do is we'll do another world load, and then from there, we'll make our way onto a later stage of the game known as the Underground Temple. Lovely and easy. Not going to be too much waiting around. Let's run back here, lovely and quick. Underground. Oh, I missed that jump button from Elden Ring so damn bad. Um, let's go ahead, Digger King. Three, two, one. Loading in, lovely and fast. Let's have a quick look. This one takes a little longer than most loading screens because it's got a lot of lighting textures. You can see all of that there getting loaded in. Uh, there's kind of a light haze fog the game uses. 
I hope, again, I've mentioned this in other videos, I hope 10 to 20 years down the line, if ever they remake this for some future generation console, that they don't do a GTA Definitive Edition, take all the fog away and make the game look terrible. But for now, I'm just going to run ahead into this next section here. Nice and simple. All we're going to do is head in straight away. Wallop going into the area. And all we're looking at here is just how quickly it's loaded in a lot of these textures later in the game that looks absolutely great let's move out the way before this guy dicks us with his fist i think for now i'm quite pleased with what i've seen there i think we can start moving back before my character dies again why not let's run over and grab that bloody big sword while we're here but yeah i'm quite pleased with what we've seen thus far um but for now yep yeah, i'm quite pleased with that i think for now we can make our way back to uh, the Nexus there for another test, but for, otherwise, let's come out of this game and make our way into our next game, the Matrix Unreal 5 Tech Demo. Here we are on the Matrix 5 Tech Demo. For those that aren't aware, this is the Unreal Engine 5 demonstration piece. It's a great little tool there for showing a lot of heavy background loading, and definitely this has been made possible with super fast uh, Gen 4 PCIe NVMe SSDs, such as this one. So let's go in. In three, two, one. And again, the test for this game breaks, or this uh, test for this tech demo is twofold. It loads in lovely and quick. And we do one driving segment, which deals with a lot more of the texture-based stuff. And then we do a very quick segment involving flight, which does a lot more of that loading asset speed. So let's go ahead and grab ourselves a vehicle. And then from there, make our way into a later area of the game we can have a look at those textures and some of the lighting effects as they get drawn out uh, you may not realize but i can't drive can you tell um but for now let's make our way through the game as quick as we can just a quick look we're not going to go too nuts here again there's a slight drop in frame rate there but that's quite normal with this tech demo uh, in the early stages of it that's not really anything to do with the ssd but for now i think that's running absolutely fine there so why don't we come out of this and make our way into uh, uh, the secondary test of this game. So what we do is we uh, head back into that menu. And then we load back. And then from there we go back into the world here. But this time we take advantage of that flight mode. So three, two, one. Lovely stuff. That felt pretty much the same there. Um... And as we load in this time, instead of driving, we're just going to, as fast as possible, move into the blisteringly fast uh, transit system of this game. So we go in and move in as fast as we can. And this is more of a pacing of not only moving those textures in and out, which is something the game has to generally do anyway, but also just because the sheer amount of data that needs to be pulled from the SSD during this part of the test. It's just huge. Even in Unreal Engine 5, which has a very intelligent method of being able to hold on to a lot of that data uh, and you know being more uh, resource efficient, only showing you things that you can see. Um, but it still does an incredible job of it. And a lot of it you can find out about if you use this tech demo here. It breaks down things into quite significant detail there about how it's able to achieve it, achieve it. But it's great for those that are trying to test this nice speedy SSDs that are gonna to need to deliver a lot of fast data as quick as possible. And I say fast data, large sequential data and 4K random, let's be realistic at times. And that's what we're doing here. But let's come out of this and get into our last test game, which is Final Fantasy VII, the remake. And we're going into Final Fantasy VII. This game loads ludicrously fast, so I'm not thinking this SSD is going to let us down. Again, we're not including title screens, could have like logos and brands and stuff like that. But for now, let's go ahead and continue the game from uh, early stage of the game. There's a few little fight sequences. There's also a nice area where we can see the silent loading. Without further ado, let's crack on. Three, two, one. Lovely and fast, as I say. And for now, all we're doing is we're making our way in as quick as we can because the game is going to use some of these segments like the one we're seeing, obviously for tutorial purposes. But on top of that, there's the obvious need for the game to do some of that silent background loading there. But there we can do. We can make our way to there. We look up. They're just getting off. 
So yeah, I'm seeing that as absolutely fine. Well, we've tested some uh, slightly less efficient SSDs out there. We have noticed the game be perhaps uh, not as quick on that segment as it needs to be because the game is definitely introducing elements of silent loading there throughout. But for now, let's go ahead and load onto that next segment. And again, the textures are great. The game's not loading anything out too poorly. We've got the kind of fixed camera stuff we sometimes see when the game's freeing up resources such as in the previous areas. But for the most part, I think that's absolutely fine there. And the game loaded just as quick as I would have liked to have seen. So for now, I'm going to come out of this game here. And I think what I'll do is I'll move these games back. And I think we should summarise everything we've covered in today's long, long video here. Because we've covered a lot. We've talked a lot about the hardware architecture. We've talked a lot about... Uh, let's move that over moving those games over now we talked about the hardware architecture of this ssd we talked a lot about the pc benchmarks there and the effectiveness of that heatsink and of course we tested it now on the ps5 and in every regard it's done exactly what they've said even surpassing it in a number of areas there it is a lesser known brand but it should be argued that even though it's a lesser known brand it's arriving at a price point that once you compare the Fizon E18 controller that's inside and that 176 layer NAND and DDR4 memory, the architecture of this SSD, at least in the hardware states, is exactly the same as some of the top tier brands in the market right now. And therefore, if you're looking at it from a hardware perspective, it's perfect. The warranty on it, maybe not as quite as supportive as something as say Seagate with their rescue recovery service, but you've still got five solid years of support there. And from a lesser known brand, and by lesser known, of course, I'm talking out in the West, not the East, I rate this SSD. I rated its predecessor, and ultimately, I would still recommend this SSD comfortably for a nice, affordable, but high-performing PS5 SSD. And if you're a PC gamer, it's a good SSD, but I think given its gear, design, and more compact nature, it's changed its price a little bit to make it more attractive to PS5 buyers. If you're a PS, if you're a PC user, it's still a good SSD, but there are, I would say, just as good SSDs in the market. But PS5 buyers, it's probably one of the best out there right now for the price point. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, click like. It really helps me understand what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. And ever since YouTube took away dislikes, now we don't know what we're doing wrong. Thank you so much for watching. Again, use the free advice section. Click subscribe as we test more SSDs and talk more and more about right and wrong storage. And I'll see you next time.